Hello, kidney warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dadvice TV Live, episode number 281. And I'd like to welcome everyone who's here for the first time. Great to have you. You're going to learn all sorts of great stuff from industry professionals. We're not going to have any of the woo-woo here, none of the fake cures, none of the fake supplements, none of that stuff. We talk about stuff that's proven by science with industry professionals. And for those that are new, let me quickly introduce myself. I am James. I, like most of you, am a kidney warrior. I was diagnosed with stage five kidney disease nearly five years ago. And since then, I've used diet and lifestyle changes. I've got my blood pressure under control. I've worked very closely with my healthcare team, with renal dietitians, to slowly improve my health. And as I did that, my kidney results also improved and my symptoms eventually went away. Now my kidneys, they're still shot. There's no fix in that. The damage that I have is permanent but I'm doing great and I'm not letting my kidneys keep me from doing the things that I enjoy. Now tonight, we're gonna talk about fluctuations and changes in your, your kidney number. And when can you cure kidney disease? And to talk about that, we have your guys' favorite guest and co-host here on Dad Vice TV, the author of the best kidney book out there, learn the facts about kidney disease. This is the book that I wish every doctor would hand out every time a person is diagnosed with kidney disease because this makes understanding kidney disease so much easier and it takes a lot of those things that we worry about and, and it solves them. It gives us answers. It tells us what we need to focus on. But that the author of that book, Dr. Stephen Rosansky, is my co-host tonight. So let's go ahead, let's welcome him. And when he's done talking about the things he has tonight, he always leaves time for your questions. So type those over there in the comments. Look, we got lots of comments already. Hey there, everybody. We got Zeus here from Phoenix, Arizona. Woo, it's gotta be hot out there right now. I think you guys are all in triple digits for over a week and it's still gonna be triple digits for a while. But let's go ahead, let's get right to our guest, Dr. Steve Rosansky. Please welcome him. Hey, doctor. Hey, James, good evening. I'm Notice I'm wearing my, my red shirt, my red t-shirt. <laughs> Pretty bright, <laughs> bright, bright colors for a bright sunny day. Actually, it's sunny out here in South Carolina. but. Not as warm as it is in some parts of the country, so I feel kind of lucky. Can get pretty hot here too. So we're going to talk about some great stuff tonight, and I hope all of you are going to learn a lot. I always learn a lot when I prepare these talks. Believe it or not, there's always more to learn, and and I try to make things as clear as I can for you folks. So James, you want me to, I guess, introduce myself and yeah, for those that are new. Yeah. So I am a retired clinical kidney specialist. I've also done a good bit of research and have published over 100 peer-reviewed publications. Um, I work at the free clinic. I was there today. Uh, and I um, wrote a book that James mentioned. And the reason why I wrote the book is because uh, too many folks uh, have been starting dialysis when they didn't need to. And my book tells you exactly uh, what the issues are regarding when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense to start dialysis. And it also goes into the issue of who's really got kidney disease and who doesn't and who needs to worry and who doesn't. So those are the big issues that I decided I needed to write a book about to get to you folks who worry a lot about being on dialysis or worry a lot about a kidney problem that you really do not need to worry about. So that's the main reason I wrote my book. And I also wrote the book because there's so many books and other things on the internet, which are just a lot of, as we talk about woo woo, a lot of nonsense. And, um, and, and along that line, I asked chat GPT to make a little po uh, song up for me about the woo woo out there that you folks may see on the internet. I'm going to give you an excerpt of it. If it's okay with James. So Go ahead. Good. Are you going to sing it? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> okay, here we go. Don't be fooled, my friend, by the web's deceitful flow. When it comes to kidney health, the truth we need to know. Dr. Google may be tempting, but be cautious, take heed. Not everything you read is what your kidneys need. Consult the trusted doctors, the specialists who know. They'll guide you through the maze, help your worries go. Don't fall for miracle cures or promises they serve. Together, we will debunk the myths, spreading awareness wide. In the fight against kidney de- disease, we'll walk with pride. <laughs> Woohoo! Not a bad job for a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, AI. Okay. Uh, and along the lines of what I just said, folks, um, I'm going to start out with, um, with we're talking about cures. And we're going to tell you tonight when there is a reasonable degree of certainty that you have actually had improved kidney function, a so-called cure, the majority of which is going to be something we call, James, what's the letters, three letters? First one is A. A K I. Which is acute kidney injury, which is just another term to say it's a reversible problem. And I try and to before look you at, get into the detail, Dr. Yeah, Rowe, can yeah. a person with CKD also have an AKI on top of it? Yes, you're absolutely right. And and one of the and that's a really good point, James. One of the things that any of you that really have CKD, and I'm talking primarily about those folks less than 45 EGFR consistently, if you do get one of the things that causes these reversible situations you're more apt to see a big change in your kidney function. Looking like you may have to go on dialysis and sometimes that may even happen short term. And unfortunately, too many people who have a short term change in kidney function wind up on dialysis permanently. Another thing I talk about in my book that you should never allow to happen to you. And if you're going to get on dialysis or you've been recently put on dialysis, Please get a hold of it and look at the section about when to start dialysis. And James, I also try to find out what other books there are out there. And I'm all in favor of having good science-based information for all of you. I'm not the only one who can produce it. But unfortunately, and there's one that just came out from another physician, and the books, all the books that I've seen, I and mean, there's one book that's very popular from a non-physician who has no business of having written it, but that's another I know story what book you're talking about. Yeah, that's, that's another story. But, um, even these physicians are talking about a lot of the woo woo stuff. I don't know why, I guess that's what sells books, but I'm not here to tell you about stuff that is not really science-based and some of those non-science-based things that you should say no to say no to the herbal medicine, the natural methods, the Ayurvedic medicine, the microbe, alterations of the microbiome, uh, the naturopathic cures, the kidney repair pills, and we'll get into this more tonight, the methods to lower your creatinine. All of these things are nonsense, nonsense. They are not science-based. I'm not saying there's no possibility that altering your microbiome may work, but look, if there's something that has come out that has been proven by what they call randomized controlled trial, which takes an enormous amount of time and energy and money to produce. And that those studies show you the benefit. That's what you need to know about the rest of the stuff. If I was you and I had a kidney problem, I would look for what has been proven to work scientifically. So and let's get right. Some get of that. these, some of these like herbs and stuff could actually harm you yeah. and you're accelerating your loss of kidney function instead of slowing it down you're doing the exact opposite while paying these people for this stuff yeah and there is uh and now, now i was in china i know, know about uh, herbal medicine i know about traditional chinese medicine and i think some of it is very interesting is primarily the doctor patient relationship has enormous benefits if you get yourself a good doctor a good doctor will have benefits 
that go beyond that science or, or medical related. Uh, but there are there are definitely herbs. There's one Chinese herb that has been documented to cause kidney failure. Be careful. And the National Kidney Foundation has you look it up. They have something about herbal medicine, alternative medicine. Please take a look at that. Let's go right to work, uh, James. And you're going to know most of this because a lot of this we've talked about on your show. Um, let's talk about the main lab test that everyone should know. The name of the lab test is what, James? Is this the renal function test? Yeah, yeah. What's the what's the lab test that determines your renal function? It is for your GFR, your glomerular yeah, filtration. Yeah. What's, or, what's the lab test that that determines your it's, glomerular filtration? Begins you know, with I a C. Is it the CBC? No, it begins with a C. Come on, James, you got to know this one. Okay, so we test for creatinine. Yes, that's and they the use lab that test. to give us the that EGFR. Is the lab say, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Everybody gets their kidney number. It is all based on the creatinine, and we need to dig in deep on that creatinine. What the heck does it mean? That's a marker to determine your kidney function. Where is creatinine? What is creatinine? Where does it come from? Do you know that, James? Maybe not. It is normal. It is from your muscles. The more muscles yes. you have, the more yeah. creatinine you have. Um, Good. Good. You know, so That's if you have legs, you have muscle. Those create creatinine. Your heartbeat creates creatinine. It is not harmful. It's just the marker that we use to estimate kidney function. All right. So now let's go on to another layer of this thing. Creatinine comes from creatine. Some of you that take some of these, um, you know, herbal medicines and other other things you may find that are not not FDA drugs may get uh, creatine. What is cre creatinine comes from creatine, which is the thing in muscle, right? Creatine. Have you, those of you who took biology one, you know, something called ATP. It's the energy molecule. And so what happens and, and the energy part is the phosphorus. So the creatine is what converts to the active form to give energy to muscle. That's simply what happens. And then after that happens, it's metabolized to creatinine. Creatinine has no function, no purpose, has nothing to do with anything other than it's a metabolic product of how much muscle you got. So, uh, and, and, creat and creatine is, is used uh, by, by, for, by some people uh, who are um, doing a lot of exercise, there's no proof that creatine helps. I'm not against it. A lot of sports supplements have creatine because of the whole thing is connected to muscle. Maybe it'll improve muscle cramps and stuff like that. But uh, neither creatinine nor creatine have any particular beneficial effect, and neither one of them has any definitive harm. Creatinine definitely is not a harmful thing. You're not trying to get creatinine out of your body because it's going to harm you. It's just a marker mm -hmm. to measure kidney function. Okay. Now we're going to get back to kidney 101. And it's all in my book. We talk about the anatomy of the kidney. What is the functioning unit of the kidney, of which right. there are about a million in each of your kidneys? The nephrons. Yay! And that's where nephrologists, nephrology, the nephron. The nephron, it's the unit of function of the kidney. There's a million in each kidney. Two parts of the nephron. I don't know if James knows this. One oh, I the, used to know it. I cannot, I cannot recall it right now. One of them has to do with the glomerular filtration rate. The glomerulus. There the we glomerulus go. glomerulus is a bunch of little tiny blood vessels. And that little glomerulus, which is these tiny blood vessels, and, and it... The filtrate out of that glomerulus goes into tubules, two parts, glomerulus and tubules. That's the whole nephron. That's what the kidneys uh, composed of, um, mainly. And um, so why did they pick creatinine? They want something that's filtered. You're measuring the filtration rate, and it's, it's filtered, and very little of it, because a lot of stuff that goes through, the uh, once it's filtered, that goes through those tubules, a lot of stuff is reabsorbed it goes back into the bloodstream if it didn't we'd all be dead 
we filter so much of our salt. We, we are basically salt water. If we didn't have that salt, the sodium chloride being reabsorbed, we, our blood pressure would drop to zero. You got to have that reabsorption of salt and water. A lot of stuff is reabsorbed. Some stuff is put in to the tubule, which is called secretion. But creatinine, very little secretion, very little reabsorption. So it's a filtration marker. That's really all it is, all right? Now, what does, so you all folks, you folks out there are getting a lab test called EGFR. The E stands for estimate. It's not the real one. It's an estimate. The GFR is the glomerular filtration rate. It's the amount of filtration in the glomerulus in mLs per minute. That's what you're measuring. Now, the main determinant, as James and I just said, is creatinine. It's a formula that's been produced, and there's a whole bunch of formulas, which we'll discuss briefly. There's a whole bunch of formulas. Unfortunately, that has made this a mess in terms of reliability of, of e any EGFR from one lab to the other from one year to the other because they've changed these formulas. So don't look for these to be an exact number at any one time and that's which and you nailed it. That's not the way it is. It's an approximation. It's an estimate. The main determinant of the formula, you got a numerator and a denominator. The main determinant is the creatinine. And this gets back to math. Numerator, denominator. Where's the creatinine? The creatinine is on the bottom. That's the denominator. denominator. See, you can tell that James is a mathematician. It's on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going way back in time now for to remember all this. <laughs> I guess you don't have to have denominators when you're selling cars. Okay. <laughs> exactly. It's all numerator when you're selling cars. <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> So, hang on, I'm trying to fix my hearing aids here. For some reason, they're not working right. All right. Um, okay. So, the creatinine is in the denominator of this equation that produces your estimated GFR. So, the higher the creatinine, what happens to the GFR? The lower it will the lower be. The GFR. So, that's really, the, simply put, that's how... They measure GFR. The numerator is a little complicated, but in essence, it's the amount of creatinine that you produce from your, which depends on how much muscle you got in 24 hours. So you got the amount of creatinine you produce in 24 hours, divided by the water body creatinine, and that's the way to get an actual measured GFR. And James knows this well. We used to have you all collect urine in jugs <laughs> and put them in the fridge because that's the way to get the actual GFR. These are otherwise all estimates, and I'm beginning to think that we should occasionally get you folks to do the real GFR, collect those 24-hour urines, because there's so much confusion about the estimated GFR. And why is there confusion, and why, why are you folks getting, uh, getting misled? You're being misled because you're going to read on the Internet that EG, that my GFR went from 60 to 50, and I, this miracle thing did it. Guess what? The 60 and 50 are the same number. Your kidney function hasn't changed. Why? Because your particular GFR is plus or minus 10% up to plus or minus 30%. And I'm going to give you examples of that in a, in a minute so you can see why not to put any, a, a lot of uh, faith in any one value. We need to look at the trend of your kidney numbers over time because any values over short periods of time, especially if they're not consistent, do not mean a damn thing. And that's why to be diagnosed, then, okay, the first way to cure your kidney disease, James knows this well. What's the, what's the way I cure your kidney disease? You come to me, I say- Get a I second you test. Have, you got it, James. The second test, I can't tell you how many people I've cured because the labs didn't get the, the number right. And that's why. Maybe they were dehydrated the first time. Could have been. Yeah, yeah. And that's why the kidney docs decided that number one, and we're going to tell you why in a minute, over 60, those numbers are pretty much worthless. 
and I'll tell you why in a minute. So you have to worry about GFR of 70 or 80, and if it goes from 80 to 75, absolutely nonsense. 90 to 70, 90 to 80, none, none of that data is reliable or useful. And so to make a diagnosis, before I would say you've got kidney disease or any other kidney doctor that's up to date on, on what, the, uh, what, what the diagnostic information is, you've got to have a value below 60 at least three months apart twice. And, and we're going to talk about this a little bit today, same goes for your protein in the urine. If, if you want to be diagnosed by, with kidney disease, you can also be diagnosed with that number above 60 if you've got significant protein in the urine. But again, it's got to be above a certain level to be significant twice repeated three months apart. And we'll tell you what those numbers are in a minute. Anybody, James, you know what a normal creatinine roughly is for a man and a woman in, in the U.S.? Oh, no, I'm okay. going to guess it was like 0.8 or something. It doesn't take Close. much of a around, change right. to be one. high. It's around one. It's around one. Now, for those of you in the rest of the world that uses the international units, you multiply our number by 88. So or roughly you multiply it by 100. So our number is roughly one. In the rest of the world, it's roughly 100. Uh, lower for women than men because less muscle in women than men. So the main determinant of what your creatinine is independent of your kidney function. And again, the creatinine is a marker, okay? <clears throat> what will have your creatinine vary? It's the amount of muscle mass, the size of the patient. So you can have a real big muscular person with the creatinine in the upper range of normal, which could be around in the U.S., 1.3 or maybe even 1.4. But if you have a creatinine of 1, and I'm going to go right into the reason why we don't use numbers over 60. If you have a creatinine of 1, the lab will say 1, 1.1, 1 0.9. But those small changes could be a massive change in your EGFR when you're over 60. It could be 10, 20 units with a 0.1 change on your creatinine. So that's why we don't even talk about uh, less than 60, uh, or more than 60 EGFRs. And, and only when you have significant protein with a more than 60 do we consider you to have a kidney disease. A hey, question for you, Doc. Yeah, yeah, sure. About the formula and the muscle mass. Yeah. In the formula, it also asks about African American, if I am. Why is that? All right, James, this is a really long, complicated issue because the sensitivity with race and that there really isn't such a thing as race and all this other stuff, which we won't get into tonight. But it is true that in general, I think uh, African American um, have more muscle per body weight than do Caucasians. And therefore, they may well have more muscle mass. But the various powers that be decided to try to not in, have to say, are you African-American or not? So they're trying to eliminate that from some of these equations. It is so confusing. But just know in general that there's no one solid number for you. It can vary a lot by the equation, by the formula. And it will vary depending upon your, uh, your body mass. The main equations that are currently used today only adjust for sex males versus females males having less muscle than uh, females having less muscle than males and age and with age we know you lose muscle mass so um can and again you can have kidney fun, uh, kidney disease with an egfr of 70 or 80 um if you have protein in the urine what is significant amount of protein in the urine in the U.S.? And it, okay, we measure the protein in the urine two general ways. One is with a dipstick, okay? And for, for what I tell people is you need to be at least one plus twice over, over three months. And even if you don't have uh, an EGFR below 60, I would consider that kidney uh, disease. For those of you outside the U.S., 
it's it's divide that by 10. So it's three. The units are a little bit crazy in the U.S. It's milligrams per deciliter. Outside the U.S. is milligrams per millimole. Uh, and what about age, James? You know how age affects what your G- EGFR should be. Yeah, we, we naturally lose about one point a year after, is it age 40? That's about right. And and just in general, if you are a young person, a young person, your EGFR normally should be definitely over 60. It should be closer to 75 or more. If you are in my age, I'm 76, uh, an EGFR of 45 or more could be normal uh, for you. So your EGFR will decline with age. Older folks with EGFRs of 45 to 60, I would not get real worried about it at all. You may or may not have kidney disease, especially if you don't have protein in the urine. The protein is the biggie, and we discussed this on a couple of my dad advice talks. We will discuss it again in the future, but proteinuria is the key determinant of the rate that you're going to lose your kidney function. The more protein in the urine, the more likely that you're going to have loss of kidney function over time. So now let's get into the things that will affect uh, the creatinine besides change in kidney function. We already mentioned a couple, James. You know what they are. Muscle mass. Get your muscle uh, mass. So who, who, may have, um, who may have a creatinine that's abnormal but has, and it's not, it has nothing to do with how, what your kidney function is? What the main ones would be, what is going to lower your kidney function? It will Dehydration. be... Dehydration. Lower your kidney function? Hydro- oh, oh. No, no. Okay. What lowers, what will, sorry, I'm, I'm confusing myself. <laughs> this is not easy. What will alter your creatinine? In other words, creatinine is dependent on muscle mass. Creatinine comes from creatine, which is in your muscle convert. The creatinine is just a normal thing. Depends on your muscle mass. If you are eating a very low protein diet, and especially if you follow one of the recommendations in a book that I won't mention the name of, but they do recommend very low protein diet in several books, uh, which I am totally against. And the International Kidney Organization is also totally against. These are the experts around the world. Stay away from the very low protein diet. That's harmful. A moderately low protein diet is beneficial, not very low. The particular situation I'm discussing, which is in a book and and, and several books, also this one particular Uh, author is uh, recommending a uh, protein keto acid supplement for very low protein diet. I think that that has rare, rare indications. My book will tell you the rare cases that I would consider. It's not for the average person. And what happens, James, is if you are on a very low protein, if you're on a normal protein diet, you go on to a very low protein diet, guess what happens to your creatinine? Very low protein diet. You lose you lose muscle mass. So and, your pro, your right? creatinine. So your muscle mass is going to get reduced. So I think eventually it's going to go down. But yes, will it exactly. temporarily spike as you're losing the muscle mass. No, no, then, no, no. Just okay. don't get too technical. Just say okay. you're right. It goes down. What if your creatinine goes down? Remember, if your creatinine is oh, in the denominator, GFR goes up. Well, look at that. I've been cured. But I've got malnutrition. I'm going to break my bones. I'm going to die of malnutrition. But I've got a fake increase in my EGFR because I got less muscle. Hello, that's not curing kidney disease, nor is it the variations in the values from your lab. And how can you raise creatinine? By the same token, very high protein diets, eating a lot of meat, mm-hmm. uh, can can theoretically increase your creatinine. And there are some drugs that can increase it, um, like. Septra, cimetidine, a few drugs that can uh, increase your creatinine. Uh, so should you try to get your creatinine down and how should you try to do it? So many testimonials on how to do it. <laughs> okay, James, well, what do you as think? a kidney patient, <laughs> when you first are diagnosed and you go online, everything's about creatinine. So you mistakenly think it's the bad guy. And that's what your goal is. 
how do I get rid of creatinine without, you know, like amputating a limb or something to remove it? <laughs> Cause right. that would remove, that would lower my creatinine, but that doesn't help my kidneys. Well, you're absolutely right, James. And if you happen to be unfortunate enough to be a bilateral amputee, your, your less muscle, your, your baseline creatinine is going to go down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have to look at, Okay, so in order to interpret the creatinine, you need stable diet, because I said very high protein diet can raise it, uh, very low protein diet can lower it, less muscle mass, uh, and of course, state of hydration can alter it, which we'll get into in a minute. But as I said earlier, that creatinine is not a real number. So let me give you an example. Let's say some of you have an EGFR 50. Is that a real 50? What's the actual number? It's within at least 10%. Yeah. And it can vary Somewhere a lot. around there. Because, because that number 50, if you go 10% from 50 is 5. So it could be 55 or it could be 45 easily. And some folks say that when they have looked at laboratory results, they can vary by as much as 30%. So these numbers could be, if, if it varied by 30%, you could have the same EGFR and one day it could be 35, and one day it could be 65. These numbers should not make you nervous, make you crazy. You need a trend and you need repeated values. And you need to have a stable muscle mass, not be losing a bunch of weight, not be losing a bunch of muscle, not be gaining a bunch of muscle, and stable state of, of hydration. Um, there is a lab test that James may know or may not that is also a marker for your kidney function, but it doesn't depend on the muscle mass like serum creatinine does. Do you know what that lab test is, James? Have you heard of it? I do not think so. Okay, it's called cystatin C. We may hear more about it because of all the confusion about serum creatinine and all the, but cystatin C is not affected by muscle mass and some uh, clinicians are using it when they can't figure out Hey, this is an older person without much muscle mass. What's the real kidney number? When I should be thinking about dialysis? Is it really that low? Um, and uh, so that's that's one way you can get around it. But there's no free lunch. That val that lab test is also variable, and it's influenced by things like you may have cancer or inflammation or being on steroids. But and I and I've looked at I looked into it, and this is really confusing because you really have to dig deep to to find out about this stuff. If you, if you look at the reviews of papers that looked at measuring kidney function with cystatin C versus serum creatinine, it's not really any better. Uh, the best one may, may be to combine the two and, and, and maybe you'll get a more accurate way uh, of measuring uh, your GFR. But it's an expensive test and uh, it's not used very often. I'll tell you, James, I think for those of you who have, uh, you know, you're very, very large, okay, BMI is over 40, uh, you're very, very small, you're very, very frail, uh, you've, you've, you've been a, uh, a vegetarian, or you have little muscle mass, there's nothing better than getting a repeated measure of your 24-hour urine collection to get the real measured GFR, not an estimate, but it's, 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 clumsy you got you know you got to collect all this urine for 24 hours and a lot of times people don't do that right yeah. and um but and I it's think, best to do it on a weekend when you don't have to work i i right. did it when i had to work and you're storing that in the refrigerator yeah i mean i think if if there's a, a question about you know just how bad your kidney function is uh well, first of all Look at my book. You shouldn't be going on dialysis unless you're symptomatic. And we don't, we're not going to get into that tonight. But, um, you know, if, if your doctor is looking at your number and say, oh, your number is XYZ, I want to put you on. And you say, well, can we actually measure it? And I'm just curious what it is. Let's, let's do a couple of these 24-hour urines. And you could tell if you got a complete co collection by looking at how much creatinine is in that urine for 24 hours. Um, I don't want to, I want to leave some time for questions. So we're going to go into the real cures. All right. Now we're going to talk about the real cures. When does kidney function actually get cured? And I think this is also good. This was, this is also taken from a, a, a GPT about 
AKI. And I, and I like this. So, and well, this is, so one of the things that I read, which I think is a good statement, don't assume when you get an abnormal kidney number that it is permanent and chronic. Okay. James experienced this himself. Yep. James, you, you will tell, tell your story real quick, James, about what happened with you. Yep. I ended, I was fine. All of a sudden I had all the symptoms of kidney disease, ended up in the ICU, GFR of eight, got it up to 13 real quickly, you know, IVs and stuff like that. And over time it took many, many months and I had to stop doing a lot of bad things, get my blood pressure under control. Um, I got up into the low thirties and I have been stable upper twenties, lower thirties. I am stable. It goes back and forth. Each time I get my labs, stable. No symptoms anymore because I got it up high enough and I'm living a much healthier lifestyle. Even though I've gained a lot of weight in the last two years, I'm much healthier than I used to be. I just eat too many carbs. So don't assume that this is a death sentence, a dialysis sentence when you get an abnormal number because it may well be reversible. It's called acute kidney injury. It's a sudden loss of kidney function, and it could be due to dehydration, severe dehydration, your medications, and we're going to get into these. Uh, infections, obstruction of your blockage of your urinary tract. We're going, to break, we're going to break into all of these. And with the right treatment like James got, which most of you hopefully will get, you can cure, reverse your kidney, your abnormal kidney function. That's real. That's not woo-woo, and it's very 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 common so so the way i look at the reversible situations i call it pre-renal which is before the kidney and i call the other one renal which is in the kidney itself and i call it post-renal which is after the kidney all right so let's break them down into these three categories the pre-renal what's the commonest and james sort of mentioned already what's the commonest pre-renal, especially this time of the year, cause of a, a rise in serum creatinine and a drop in GFR. James is pointing to it. Absolutely. Dehydration. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you Absolutely. could be dehydrated and not even know it. Yeah. Yeah. And the way you would know it is, you know, you're sweating a lot. Uh, you go get your urine test. And I don't know if you remember this, the, the thing on the urine test that tells you if you're dehydrated. It's, it's called the weight, something weight, specific or, gravity, specific, specific gravity. gravity. That's it. If, if you get a dipstick on your urine, you'll see specific gravity. The higher it is means you're concentrating your urine. You're probably dehydrated and you may also have a high blood count. Hemoglobin could be high, but it mostly is history, vomiting, diarrhea, and your BON and creatinine went up, especially as James said earlier, acute on chronic. You already got a creatinine of two. You got an EGFR of, let's say, 40, 30, 40. Um, get a little dehydrated. It could easily go down to 15, 10, 15. Hydrate you up. Don't go on dialysis. You didn't need it. You just needed some hydration. Or you needed some other things, which we'll get into. These are reversible causes of, of bad kidney function. Dropping your blood pressure can also cause you to get your uh, kidney function to go, to go down. Especially those of you who are on new drugs, you first start them, especially if your drop, blood pressure drops a lot. Let's say you go from 200 down to, let's say, 130. Your kidney may not be happy with that, and you may get a, uh, a rise in creatinine drop in GFR. Any of you have had any bleeding episodes, another way to uh, get your kidneys unhappy. Pre-renal, not enough flow going to those tiny little blood vessels. That's, what about your heart? Can you be pre renal from your heart? Yeah, if your pump's not pumping enough blood to these kidneys, that's another way to get your BUN and your creatinine up. I won't get it to BUN. To get your creatinine up and your GFR down. And as a matter of fact, uh, it's very common for people, half of the folks with CKD have heart failure. It's a very common combination, heart failure and kidney failure. And... Uh, one of the things that too many doctors are afraid of is they're not going to give you enough water pills to treat your heart failure, to get you to breathe better. I see this all the time. To get that horrible swelling, the edema, 
from the heart failure and the kidney failure. You need to get enough diuretics. And it's been shown that that will help you live longer, help you breathe better. And it actually helps your kidney. So your doctor, if you got a lot of swelling and your doctor's afraid that your GFR went down when they gave you diuretics, say, doc, and look in my book, we discuss it. And you could bring it to your doc and say, hey, why don't you give me some more of those water pills? Because my legs are swollen, really huge, and I'm really uncomfortable. Um, now, there are drugs that all of you take that can commonly cause your GFR to go down. What's the real common one, James? That it we is for- an ACE or an ARB. We're going to get to that. That's a good one. But the common ones we use for things outside of the kidney world, aches and pains, the NSAIDs, oh, yes. the NSAIDs, the NSAIDs. All of you take NSAIDs, naproxen, ibuprofen, the leave, the Advil, the Motrin. Very, very common causes of a decrease of your estimated GFR. And the safest one, frankly, is the Motrin, the ibuprofen. You can expect easily a 30% decline in GFR uh, from these NCs. So it's a very common cause, especially if you've been having vomiting or diarrhea, you've had a little flu or you've had a little uh, virus and you've had sweating and fever and you're dehydrated and an NSAID and you've already got some CKD, on very common, your GFR can temporarily go down. Stop the NSAID, get hydrated, you're fine. Um, now, I want to briefly talk about the aches and pains and NSAIDs, but um, there's a bunch of different NSAIDs. You're probably better off using Motrim. Uh, you want to use it for the shortest time as possible uh, for two reasons. One, your kidneys could be harmed. Two, if you've been on these drugs for over a month, I hate to tell you this, but you're increasing your risk of a heart attack. And, and that's something that's come out in recent, recent years. These NSAIDs can not only hurt your kidneys, but they can increase your risk of a heart attack. And there are certain, and they also cause, what's the other common problem with NSAIDs? James, you probably know about this. They cause what kind of a problem for a lot of people? GI problems, they call GI bleeds, oh. they cause reflux. And so they said, okay, there's, there's, a new, there's a different type of an NSAID that doesn't affect the stomach lining as much, but guess what? So you won't get as much GI bleeding. It's called a COX-2 inhibitor. But, but there was a higher risk of having a heart attack. So there's no free lunch, you know. Um, so, and, and these NSAIDs, are working pre-renal because they also, that's why they can cause the reversible change in kidney function. They're not getting enough of that flow going into the glomerulus. Okay, there's other drugs, and James already mentioned some of them, that work uh, to decrease the flow to the glomerulus. And James mentioned the two that we talk about almost every Dadvice show. Aces and arms. The aces end in... um, and the ARBs end in TAN, and then the SGLT2 drugs, the new diabetes drugs, that all of these drugs have been shown to help slow or reverse kidney problems in people with proteinuria. And the GLP-1s, we had a big discussion about these uh, on the Dadvice show on proteinuria. I'm going to talk to you more about this next talk, because I, I told James, there's late, the latest guidelines from the International Kidney Organization are out, and I'm going to be discussing them, and they talk about all these new medicines. So if you have a combination of vomiting, diarrhea, and you're on one of these drugs, you got a more likely uh, situation to get a reversible acute renal failure. In men, real common acute renal failure, you got big prostate, blocks the urine flow, urine backs up, can cause acute renal failure. Put a Foley catheter in and it can cure the acute renal failure. Um, so the other kidney problems besides, now we're, now we're into the renal. We did the pre-renal, okay. We did the post-renal, that's mostly big prostates. Rarely the kidney stones because you got to block both kidneys with stones. That's rare. Uh, 
in the kidney itself, you got the glomeruli, and then you have the interstitial. Now, we hadn't really talked about this. I want to mention it because it's, it's not that common, but so many drugs can cause acute renal failure. You stop the drug, the kidney can get better. You can get it from all kinds of antibiotics. You can get it from the drugs we're using for GERD, the PPIs like Prilosec, Omeprazole, and Nexium. They can cause, they can affect the kidneys. They affect what you call the interstitium. So you have the, in the kidney, you have the nephrons, and you have all the tissue around them. That's the interstitium. That can block the flow of uh uh, in the glomerulus too, that can cause acute renal failure. Now, now for the other, those ones, it, the, yeah. it's not permanent damage; it's temporary. Is that why they right, have you right. only take it for like thirty days? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, the thing is, it, it, most times you take one of these drugs, it's not going to cause this. This is this is a kind of an allergic thing. So, in other words, you're allergic to the antibiotic or something. It's going to affect your kidney and cause you reversible acute renal failure. And the other big one, which we're not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, is the glomerular diseases. And as we talked about on the, the advice on proteinuria, the glomerular diseases, meaning you have a significant protein in the urine, that's the hallmark of a glomerular disease. And the newer drugs, well, the ACEs and ARBs will definitely slow the decline of kidney function with glomerular disease, people with high protein in the urine. And then we have the SGLT2s and PLP1s, which you folks who are losing weight are taking the um, uh, semaglutide, the ozempic type drugs. These drugs have been shown to slow the decline of kidney function and decrease deaths from heart related things. So they're great drugs. We'll review them again next time. The SGLT2s, GLP1s, and James mentioned earlier tonight the aldosterone antagonists. Uh, we really don't have time to get into them tonight, but we'll talk about them on the next show when I update you on uh, what the International Kidney Organization of Doctors is saying currently about the recommendations for treatment and diagnosis. The last one I'll mention is x-rays. Uh, most of the contrast we use today to do x-rays is pretty safe for your kidneys, but generally speaking, those of you with CKD4, EGFR is less than 30, I would be reluctant to take the x-ray without getting the right preparation. What's the right preparation? If you need an x-ray with contrast, hydrate the heck out of those kidneys, and that'll protect them uh, and to keep them from going into acute uh, kidney failure. So I covered a lot, and I know you got some questions, and James, you may have some questions for you, and I want to give some time for your questions. We got quite a few questions. Now, anyone out there, type in questions you have. They'll pop up on my screen. They'll pop up on Doc's screen. And we'll go through and try to answer as many as we can. Um, here's one I definitely want to bring up for you. This is from Tim. Tim Smith, 64, or 64 years old. EGFR is in the mid-70s. Hasn't had a urine test done, but is doctor says he has ckd and he's wondering why so am i tell your doctor to, to get educated because unfortunately that's not the way to diagnose ckd at your age 64 first of all we're not calling it ckd unless it's less than 60 twice measured at least three months apart and any doctor who is evaluating a patient with kidney problems they must do a minimum a urine dipstick for protein at a minimum. It's probably a lot more important than that EGFR number, mm -hmm. which, as we said, is very variable, and you don't really start worrying uh, until you're less than 60. Yeah, and at 64 years old, wow, this is a great EGFR. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not necessarily great, but it's not diagnostic of CKD. I can't uh, – no one could say – that that number means that you have absolutely, you know, normal kidney function. But the reason why we even diagnose CKD at EGFRs of around 50 to 60 is not that you're going to go on to dialysis. It's not that you got to worry about getting a kidney transplant. It's what, James? Why is it important to know? It's just what? It's a risk factor for having heart attacks and strokes. That's I'm glad you did not make me say the word. <laughs> 
That's the main thing. And so it's not something that, oh, I got an EGFR of 60 or 70 or 55 or, or 60, and I need to worry about dialysis. Extremely unusual. Extremely unusual. One in 100, one in 1,000 maybe. But it's mostly those that have the protein in the urine. All right, here's a great question from Mickey, which also applies to me, so I'm going to get it out here. Are there any issues with colonoscopy prep that will make kidney function worse? No, no. Look, uh, the colonoscopy prep, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, and what do they tell you to do? They tell I haven't you done drink. mine yet. I've been putting mine off. Yeah, well, they tell you to take the stuff which gets you to clear out your colon. But you're not clearing out your colon without doing what? What James drinking. Just did. Drink, you drink, gotta drink. be drinking. So they're not gonna allow you to get dehydrated. If for some reason you're not feeling up to drinking, you could get dehydrated. If you're sick, we, you shouldn't be doing this prep unless you're feeling okay. So that you can take the stuff to clean out your colon and make sure you stay hydrated. Because if you're not staying hydrated, so many of the drugs that we mentioned tonight can easily get your kidney function to go down. Whether you're on an NSAID, whether you're on an ACE or an ARB, whether you're on an SGLT2, whether you're on the GLP-1s, the weight loss drugs, all of these drugs can, with dehydration, drop your GFR. All right, here is a question you're gonna to love to answer, Doc. Mo asks, what are the symptoms that mean you should start dialysis? That's a great question. And I, okay, so I'll give you, I have to give you a little background here. Uh, and this is not going to apply to most of your audience. So I don't want to take up too much time tonight. Um, we have used the EGFR in a terrible way. We have overdiagnosed kidney disease. When they first came out with that, EG, the estimated kidney number, they were diagnosing people left and right with EGFRs of 60, 70, 80, 90, worrying the heck out of people until they finally came to the realization that that's not kidney disease, okay? And then they started using that number to, to, to use to put people on dialysis. And back in the day when I started this business, it's over 40 years ago, we had to get an actual GFR, your creatinine clearance, 24-hour urine collections. And we wouldn't even think about dialysis till you're like 5 to 10. But they started putting on dialysis at EGFRs of 10, 15, and higher, which is what you got to read my book about. Don't be one of these people that has, that goes on a machine when you don't need it. Okay. Um, people can get symptomatic with G EGFRs in the 10 to 15 range if you've got heart failure. If your heart and your kidneys aren't working well, you're not going to be able to get rid of the fluids, even with aggressive diuretic use. So, Sometimes, if you've got heart failure and kidney failure, you may need to start in the 10 plus range. If you don't have, if you got a good heart, uh, you can probably not have symptoms until you're below five. What are the symptoms? The main question for me is if your potassium is high and we can't keep it under control with medicines or diet, we can't get your fluids under control. You got too much fluid in your body. I can't get the fluid off. You get shortness of breath. Good reason. The others are very rare. We used to have people have something called pericarditis where they have fluid around the heart. Very rare these days. We dialyze way, way before that happens or even seizures back way in the day. Uh, the main symptom that comes with kidney disease relates to the thing we talked about a few talks ago is anemia. But we can cure and treat the anemia with drugs. When I started in this business, people were mostly sick because they were walking around with hemoglobins of five and six oh. instead of 10 to 13. So that will make you feel pretty crappy. <laughs> yeah, uh, from all my symptoms, the worst was the anemia because it took so long to get over it and everything was just so difficult to do and even yeah. concentrating was hard yeah all right we got another great question chaz asks what's the significance of bun the bun okay bun is blood urea nitrogen okay so um where does it come from it comes from proteins 
blood urea nitrogen is much, much, much more variable even than creatinine. Remember we talked about all the things that can mess up your creatinine to make the creatinine values unreliable, which in turn will make the EGFR unreliable. Well, guess what? In the old days, the docs, we, make, we made fun of them. They talked about, well, your BUN is XYZ and you got kidney failure. Well, that doesn't diagnose kidney failure because there's so many things that can affect it. One good example, you can have a BUN of 200, normal is 10, and a creatinine of only, let's say, one and a half or two. <laughs> so they, and, and that could, you can have high BUN from bleeding, from severe dehydration, from so many other things, from, from breaking down tissue. Uh, it's just not, no longer used as a marker of whether you have kidney disease. Um, and, uh, and the blood urea nitrogen will build up as your GFR goes down, but there's too many other factors that can affect it. So we no longer use it as an indicator of your GFR, of your kidney function. Now, Coco, she posted a few things and pretty much she went into kidney failure when she went into labor and she was told her kidneys would come back. She pees a lot, but her, her EGFR is still really low. Um, any advice that you can think of for her? Here's my advice. And I tell you, I give this to people all the time. And I've got a, a colleague of mine who's whose mom. She's older. And and, uh, and I told her that mom didn't need to go on dialysis because she's still making urine. The thing that has shown the best predictive value for how well you're going to do when you've got advanced kidney disease is how much urine you're making. And as long as even at very low levels of kidney function, if you're a relatively young person and you can keep your potassium under control and you're putting out lots of urine, that's a good indicator that you, number one, if your urine is increasing, you may be reversing the renal failure of your pregnancy. Looking at urine output sequentially, and if they're increasing, that can indicate you're getting better. And if you're at advanced CKD, and, and uh, your doc wants to put you on dialysis, if you're making a good bit of urine, even at low GFRs around five, you may be able to do fine for a while, for a good while. So urine output is very important as a prognostic indicator. Here's a good, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Can blood pressure medications affect EGFR? Yeah, so one of the pre-renal causes of reversible kidney failure, which can be easily cured, <laughs> is when your blood pressure is down, you get your blood pressure up. There are situations, if you have a blood pressure 180 and it goes down to 90, you may get something called ATM, which we didn't get into. It's a form of, a, of acute reversible kidney failure where your kidneys can shut down for a couple of weeks and then they can recover gradually. That's another way that kidneys can get better. Anyone who goes on dialysis because they had normal kidney function and then it went into a level that your doctor said you need to go on a machine, ask your doctor, are my kidneys recovering? Watch my urine output. Watch my kidney numbers. Let me try to go with a few days without dialysis as long as my potassium is okay and I'm putting out enough urine because too many people stay on dialysis that didn't need to stay on it. And guess what? If you stay on dialysis and you continue to remove fluid, you're gonna knock those kidneys off. Mm -hmm. So that's the deal. Okay, we are almost at the top of the hour. I wanna get one last question, at least get a short version of the answer for this. Um, Kim is vegan and she's wondering how to get the protein out of her urine, how to reduce her protein leakage and she's vegan, and I assume she's thinking that it's because of not eating meat. What, what can she do to reduce her protein in her urine? Okay, well, first of all, I think that a relatively low protein diet makes sense for all people that really have kidney disease. Because the higher the protein, we know that that can uh, affect your kidneys in a bad way. That can worsen kidney function, having very high protein. So it's a moderately low protein diet, which would be 60 to 80 grams is a rough ballpark number. But much more importantly, if you've got significant protein in the urine, 
that would be 300 in our world in the U.S. or 30 in the rest of the world. This is albumin creatinine ratio. Okay, uh, if it's over 30 in the in the rest of the world, over 300 for the U.S. listeners, then the drugs that we talked about on that bad vice on proteinuria, all of those drugs need to be considered for your treatment. The ACEs, the ARB, the SGLT2s, the GLP1s, and the ALDO antagonists. That's a lot on the plate, and there's a lot to it. And I will I try to address some of this at our next advice, but I, I, I highly recommend you listen to that proteinuria advice, which is uh, I don't know, six months ago or something like that. Yeah, I have not seen how many views it had, but it was approaching 600,000. Yeah. The last time I looked. And for those of you out there, if you go to dadvicetv.com, there's a search bar, re- type in reduce protein. You will see that video come right up. You can click and watch it. It's a bit hard to find it on YouTube unless you're really good at navigating live broadcast because YouTube kind of puts them in a different section. But go to dadvicetv.com, the website, and you'll be able to do a quick search. We are now over our hour, Doc. I want to show your book one more time because people were asking what the title of it is. It's Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. And there is a link in the description. You can also type in go.dadvicetv.com slash book. And that will take you to this book on Amazon. It can be ordered from any bookstore you normally go to. Um, I would recommend visiting a mom and pop store. They could use the extra foot traffic because, you know, Amazon's hard to compete with. They're gigantic. But thank you, Doc, for being here again. Great. I even learned more new stuff. Always learning more stuff. And you keep me sharp by quizzing me. (laughs) And I'm very glad you you did not make me say the... (laughs) Hardening of the Atherosterotic arteries. Word. Cardiovascular disease. <laughs> there you go. I'm gonna one Arteries. day I'm gonna I'm gonna surprise you. I'm gonna practice it so that I can say it smoothly and accurately. <laughs> All right, everybody. I will be back tomorrow night for half an hour with Jen Hernandez, a renal dietitian from plantpoweredkidneys.com. And we're gonna take your questions. It's just open mic. We get on there. You get to ask her your questions for half an hour. And she'll answer them. And Dr. Rowe will be back here again next month. I'll post it on Facebook. If you're on YouTube, subscribe and turn on notifications. You have to do it in two places, on YouTube and on your device, so you'll get the notifications when I schedule the upcoming shows that we can catch them right from the beginning. And I'd appreciate, everybody, if you could share these videos with others so we can get the word out. There's so much benefit to learning about kidney disease early, especially before they start you on dialysis. And this is the type of information that could help keep people off of dialysis or at least delay it until they actually do really need it. All right, Doc, thanks again for being here. And thanks everybody out there. I'll see you guys all in the next video. Bye everyone.